Now, earlier this year, I released a video where I basically predicted or just stated watches that I wanted to see in the future. And the first watch that I mentioned was seeing different variations of the Tudor Black Bay 58 series with colors. And now today we're looking at a watch that I wanted to see, I expected to see, and now it's been pretty hyped up with this Tudor Black Bay 58. Yes, it's hyped, but is it still great? We're gonna take a closer look. Over the last decade, Tudor has really become the Black Bay company for the most part. And I don't think this is a bad thing. I think they recognize what the Black Bay has really meant for the company, both economically, but also I think separating themselves from outside of the shadow of their bigger brother of Rolex. The family was first introduced back in 2012 alongside the Pelagos, a watch that I hope can get more love as well in the future, but I digress there, with the first Black Bay reference being the 79220R, a watch that I have reviewed and labeled as the most important Tudor watch ever made, which I think is a fair assessment given the economic impact it had on the brand. This early edition, along with the other colorways, remain some of my favorites of the line, even following other releases and considering they use Atta movements as a result of their thinner cases, easy serviceability, and the Tudor rose on the dial and that circular font at the six that I think is simple and minimal. Shortly after the success of these, Tudor then jumped into the world of in-house movements, with the first making its way into their North flag and eventually making its way into the Black Bay shortly after. These newer Black Bay references were great in a lot of ways, longer power reserve, in-house movement. However, the thick thickness of these pieces were always an issue, running well over 14 millimeters, making them just a bit too chunky for those with smaller or medium sized wrists out there, or just for those that wanted a more classic wearing experience. This thought amongst a lot of consumers made it clear that there was a segment of the market that the Black Bay was not meeting, which was finally addressed with the widely popular release of the Black Bay 58 Black in 2018. The watch did many things right. It took the popular looks of the line and combined it with the upside that came with the longer power reserve, the in-house movement, while providing it in a case size that wore like classic divers of decades prior. And with its success, it was only a matter of time before we saw another version of the Black Bay 58. And with it now being 2020, I think the only surprising factor about all of this in this entire process is how actually long it took for us to get here to get a new one. So with the overall perspective that I'm trying to take with this overall review here, it's very much gonna be from a buyer perspective because I have to say, I am very much in the market for this watch. Personally, I was very much awaiting what Tudor was gonna do at Basel last year. Now, Basel is, of course, no longer basically a thing anymore, but the world has certainly changed, but very excited in terms of being able to review this watch. And also a big shout out to Chris. He's a follower of the channel and actually loaned this watch in for review. So big thanks, man. Give you a shout out here. And guys, I know this is a more expensive watch, but say you have a more restrained budget, you want an awesome dive watch, I just added Orient to my site as an authorized dealer with one of the watches that I wanna showcase here with the Kano. I looked at the Kamasu earlier this year, but I think the Kano is one that doesn't maybe get as much love, but it's a really awesome watch. I'll have a link in the description, check it out. Great diver for around two, 300 bucks. But now let's take a closer look at this watch from a high level. First here, we have the reference M79030B. So the case size, 39 millimeters, thickness 11.7 millimeters, lug width is 20 millimeters, lug to lug of 47.5 millimeters, water resistance 200 meters, movement is an automatic MT5402, crystal is sapphire, and then for price here, we have $3,375 on the fabric and the leather strap, and if you want for it on the bracelet, $3,700. Now first when looking at the most appealing factor of the Tudor Black Bay 58 and why it has really become such a popular watch, I think most of this has happened as a byproduct of its wearability. So I know there are many out there that are fans of larger size watches that Rolex and Tudor have rolled out over the past decade. That said, I have always been much more in favor of the classic pre-maxi case sports models from Rolex and the classic sizing of say some vintage Tudor subs. They had slimmer lugs, nice lug to lug distance, and it was a sizing structure that I think was very much abandoned in the past decade. And these watches are probably the closest thing in probably a decade that really resemble what that sizing was like. And by close, I mean nearly identical as this watch has the same lug to lug and nearly the same thickness of that of the Submariner 16610. And in my case as well, the 16570 Explorer 2. 
which I both think wear incredibly well on the wrist. When it comes to the world of Tudor Black Bays though, this is even a bigger move. As before the 58, no Black Bay really felt right for me personally. You could say the earlier versions of the 79220s were, I think, in favor for myself uh, with the Etta's inside, but still, it was just a little bit off in terms of the case size. But with this watch not being out until just now, it was the real reason why I decided to go and buy my vintage Tudor Submariner a few years back. But at 36 millimeters now and looking at this, I think it's honestly a little bit small for me. But to transition back here, the case comes back with a predominantly satin finish with a polished chamfer. Bracelet follows in similar form with that satin finish and comes in a riveted style, which I know this is usually an area where people express that they're not as big of fans of this, but I'm pretty indifferent here. The fold over clasp is secure and has a very snappy locking system, which gets help from the ceramic pins inserted that will assist in the slower deterioration of the locking mechanism. But I must say, I would love to see Tudor unveil the Tudor Pelago style clasp in other watches of theirs. That might create a bit of conflict of differentiation, but no doubt to me, it is by far the best bracelet that Tudor makes with its on the fly adjustment within the clasp. Along the right side of the case, we have a screw down crown and a sign with the Tudor Rose, which I always like the inclusion of. The aesthetics on this piece is pretty much unchanged outside of the color, which we will get to in a moment. It features the same writing on the dial, the Tudor shield at the 12, the same handset with a snowflake hour hand, the same applied numerals with superluminova within that shine nicely with some incandescence in the dark. The sapphire crystal is just ever so slightly domed, walking the line of providing just a little bit of added style while not unnecessarily making the watch too thick. The bezel is unidirectional, 60 click, and is smooth in its action with a nice audible click as well. For its styling, it has an anodized aluminum insert to match the color of the dial. But I think with that said, I think it's important to talk about the big change here, obviously with this watch, which is the color. And I know this is probably silly for some people, it's blue, whatever, who cares, but I think it's important to actually look at the different shade of blue. And I think the best way to differentiate this is to look at a few different models, one being the Smurf, one being my personal Tudor Submariner, as I think this one walks right in between in terms of its shade. And why I think this is kind of important is because when I was looking at a lot of press photos, it was really hard to pinpoint what was the shade of this blue. Now, when looking at the Smurf, I always thought that this was a little bit more of a lighter shade of blue, if you've ever seen these in person, a little bit more playful. I'm not personally as much of a fan of this type of blue, but I think it works pretty well when you're combining it with that white gold case than it would on stainless steel. On the other side of the aisle, we have my personal Tudor Submariner 75090. So this one has much of a more navy color in terms of what it's delivering darker shade, it almost transitions to a bluish black when going into lesser light. And I think a lot of this is a byproduct of it being maybe a little bit older, of course, but still, I think this is a beautiful blue and right in between here is where I think this Tudor Black Bay 58 falls. I think it does kind of push more to the end of that navy side, but I don't think it's really a true navy. I would say it's kind of a darker cobalt blue uh, with its color style. So just for those out there, they're just kind of understanding where this is at. And I think if you see these three side by side, you can kind of get a better understanding of where this one falls. Now transitioning to the back of the watch, we have a simple closed case back that follows the Oyster style in a way that houses the in-house caliber, the MT5402. So this movement here is really the driving force in making this 58 possible. One of the other in-house movements that was featured in other black bays was the MT5602. So this movement is a bit larger than the one occupying the 58 here, with it being 31 millimeters in diameter and six millimeters thick. On the other hand, this MT5402 that's coming in this 58 here has a diameter of 26 millimeters and the thickness of just under five millimeters, making it easier for the 58 to achieve these dimensions, especially in the area of thickness, which I think was really the primary challenge to overcome for other black bays in my opinion. So this movement also gets the added benefit being cost certified. It has a 70 hour power reserve, which is great and it operates at four hertz, 28,800 vibrations per hour. Also has a hacking movement, so when you pull out the crown to the farthest position, you can stop the second, and it's hand winding as well. Now just to unpack here and kind of share some final thoughts on this watch and what my opinion of this watch is. So I know this was an expected watch, but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing and something that we should hold against this piece. It really was just a no brainer for Tudor to release this watch. It was bound to happen. And I'm really glad that they did because I've been waiting for a blue diver watch from Tudor with this case size. It just made a lot of sense. And I think that classic fit of a sports watch from Tudor 
has kind of been abandoned a little bit with the Black Bay. And I think much of that came from when it was initially released. 2012, the norms of watches were so different than they are now. But in addition to the styling, if you just look at the larger landscape of watches, I think you're getting a fairly priced piece that is positioned uniquely in the market to be a standout for the price. In other words, I think it separates itself from the other great watches that falls, I would say, in the tier below, say like a Longines, a Rado, an Oris, but also can hang with what is being offered above by Omega, maybe not from the movement standpoint with their coaxials, but when you do consider that a lot of Omega Seamasters really aren't going to be able to compete in terms of a wearing experience in regards to dimension. Mentions, I think this makes it even more of a case. And I personally like the blue more than the black as I just feel it's more youthful and fun. And again, that's a matter of personal preference. But when I think of Tudor, those are the kind of adjectives I think and associate with the brand and allow them to differentiate from Rolex. The black to me, it does, yes, I think differentiate a little bit from that of the Submariner, but this one just feels a little bit different and even furthers that separation. And if I am being honest, I have to say, I'm actually strongly considering picking one of these up. If I end up doing that, I probably would sell my Tudor Submariner as a result of that, because I think that'd be way too much overlap in the collection. But to simply say it, I think this is a great watch. Expected, yes. Hyped, yes. But still very solid for the money. Well, all right, guys, I want to hear your thoughts on this new Tudor Black Bay 58. I know a lot of people have already talked about this and reviewed it online, and there's a lot of people just interested in it. I think this year, for the most part, we had a lot of expectations on what would come with new watches and with the whole event calendar being thrown off, it's been a little bit weird. So this was one of the watches I think has really garnered up the most amount of buzz this year for the most part from a mass market point of view. Uh, but love to see comments down below. I'm a big fan of it. I think it's a no brainer for Tudor and I think it's a watch that I would strongly consider getting and I am strongly consider getting. In addition, if you did like the video, thumbs up, subscribe, hit the bell icon and also check out that Orient Cano as well. Head to my website, teddybaldestar.com. I'm a full authorized dealer of 20 brands there. Have a great variety, gonna be adding more soon. And if you do have any questions specifically about watches on my website, you can actually book a call with me. Be happy to jump on a call as well to help you through your next purchase. But guys, thank you again so much for watching. Be well, and I will see you all very soon.